Hi, Michael Yardney here, and if you're like many Australians, you're probably wondering what's ahead for our property markets in 2024. Clearly, inflation is going to be with us a bit longer, and interest rates are going to be around a bit higher than many of us were hoping for. So what does this mean for our property investment plans? Well, in this masterclass, Dr. Andrew Wilson and I are going to discuss the main drivers of the housing markets in 2023, and how they're going to be very different in 2024, how Australia's housing markets are likely to perform in the next couple of years, and Dr. Andrew Wilson is going to be sharing with us his proprietary housing barometer, where each state's going to be in the property cycle and his forecast for 2024. That's going to come at the end of the session, because beforehand we're going to explain a bit more about what's happening in the economy, how each state's going to be at a different stage of the cycle, what's going to happen to rents, and maybe some suggestions of what you could do as well. So thanks for joining us, and let's get on to understand what's ahead for our property markets in 2024, and what Dr. Andrew Wilson, who's had a great track record at predicting housing, what he's suggesting is going to happen in the year ahead. Forget the crash warnings and the whispers of fears of a property apocalypse. They abounded 12 months ago, didn't they? But 2023 in Australian real estate turned out to be a year of surprise for some as the housing markets defied the negative predictions and property values rose for 11 months in a row. And at the same time, rents skyrocketed. It was really a year of two halves. In the first half of the year, sellers were nervous and there was little stock on the market. But in the second half of the year, sellers got on with their lives, bringing more properties into the market. But the supply of existing and new dwellings just couldn't keep up with the demand, which was inflated by our booming population growth. Of course, throughout the year, the media is full of stories about inflation, about interest rates, about decreased housing affordability, a housing and a rental crisis and booming immigration. So today I look forward to looking back at the year that was with Australia's leading independent housing economist, Dr. Andrew Wilson, the Chief Economist of My Housing Market, and hearing his thoughts about what's ahead for 2024. And I'm particularly keen to hear his forecasts for the year ahead. And I say that because if you look back over the years, not just last year, but for a long time I've been working with Andrew, his forecasts have been particularly accurate. Hello, Andrew. Yeah, good day, Michael. And it's good to get to the end of the year. <laughs> it's been a certainly a challenging year to start because we did have a lot of negativity. We should be used to that, I guess. It's been a real cycle over the last decade of ridiculous forecasts of doom and gloom, which have all proven to be wrong. And uh, this year was no exception. You must call this a strong market. We'll look at the results now. We've got just about most of all, all the data just about in now. We can see how our markets perform, not just our markets. We'll, we'll also have a quick look at how our economy performed as well. And uh, it's been a very positive year. And as you said, we'll have a look forward as well. And uh, I think we're in for a, another positive year next year. Not sure we'll be quite as strong in terms, particularly of prices growth, but I do think we'll finish in the black. I'm not going to put too much of a disclaimer on that prediction. But we almost always have to be wary of those outside forces. That well, there are so many outside forces that could come. Yes, Michael. Well, we've put together a, a presentation here for everyone to, uh, I guess, uh, enjoy but looking back and what's happened. I'm sure there are some people, unfortunately, who are watching this today who think, I shouldn't have waited to get the timing right. I shouldn't have uh, waited for all the stars to align. I should have taken advantage of the market. And may I make a prediction before we start? There are going to be some people in 12 months' time who are saying the same again. So don't try and time the market. I think that's a really that's right. good lesson. 100%, Michael. Yes, just you, you work on your individual circumstances, you know, whatever your needs are. And I think the key to, to market time Timing is to remain within the market itself as a buyer and a seller. So you don't get that pause between either buying and selling and selling and buying, which is when you can miss out. And uh, I think that's the key. Remain in the market. If prices are higher, okay, you've got to pay a little bit more, but you get a little bit more for your trading. So that's the offset. And it's all about uh, those individual choices that you make. Not about, according to your circumstances, not trying to pick whether the market's going to rise or fall. I mean, this is property. This is uh, a long-term proposition and uh, it's not a share or uh, a horse or you know something that you're taking a position on in terms of speculation. So uh, let's have a look at the year that was, Michael, in terms of 2023. We did see a rebound in most of our capital city markets. And as usual, we trot out the saying, robust and resilient. 
when we're referring to Australia's capital city housing markets generally. Just quickly, the economy, I guess, also outperformed most uh, of the predictions of doom and gloom. We did see interest rates rising earlier in the year, but then we saw interest rates actually go into pause mode in May, which was uh, maybe a little bit questionable given still strong economic performance. But the Reserve Bank moved back to raise rates in November, uh, concerned about rising inflation. But again, we're back to a hold position. I think the Reserve Bank would be reasonably happy about the circumstances now going forward. So perhaps the times will suit the Reserve Bank, even though they perhaps went into pause mode a little sooner than was uh, indicated by what was a very strong economic performance. And here's that performance, Michael. Look at that very low unemployment rates right through the year. Just pushed up a little bit over November, but um, that had a lot to do with a record surge in migration, record participation rate. And we're still creating tens of thousands of jobs, even though our unemployment rose a little bit, mainly because of uh, that surge in the workforce, the, the size of the workforce, which is now clearly at a record level. So good news on the economy for the unemployment rate. Inflation, that's the inflation chart. Yes, just uh, has certainly, this is underlying inflation, Michael, has eased from that peak of 7.2% at the beginning of the year. But um now down to 5.3%. So the trend is positive, but we just look back to prior to COVID or during COVID, Michael, and you can see just how low inflation was in Australia. So we've got a lot of hard yards yet to travel to get inflation back to that 2 to 3% target, which is what the Reserve Bank is, ma is mandated to do, to produce. So still some work to do, and um, but uh, we are starting to see at least the trend moving downwards in terms of underlying inflation. Good news for those struggling with higher interest rates. Wages grew at a record 4%, the latest data over the September quarter, Michael. No surprise there, given how strong the labour market is. And I would expect it to continue to see wages grow, but real wages are still falling, noting that underlying inflation is at 5.3% but wages are growing at 4%. So not great news there for wage earners with higher prices certainly impacting family budgets. Retail sales still high. There's been a lot of mention about um, consumer sentiment and confidence, but the surveys have shown us that confidence was a little subdued, consumer confidence, but retail spending was still at very high levels, Michael. We're yet to get the November figures out, uh, and that'll be interesting because November, of course, is a very strong month for retail sales with Black Friday sales, etc. But retail sales still very strong even though they've eased, are still at those remarkably high levels that were generated by the COVID stimulus packages. Well, Andrew, a lot of people came into these difficult times with cash stashed away. There were all the incentives that happened over the COVID period. So we ended up having offset accounts, prepaying our mortgages. So that made it easier. People had money to spend on themselves. I think a lot of people came into this period also thinking, I had a difficult year or two, I deserve something more. So retail spending on holidays, vacations also went up a lot, didn't it? Yes. And the point is, Michael, that we're tracking around about 40% higher in terms of our retail spend uh, now compared to the pre-COVID, I guess, normal levels. So that's obviously a very big lift still, that 40% increase. And yes, we have inflation, which has inflated this data. And yes, we have more people because of the migration surge. But nonetheless, I don't think that accounts for that 40% increase. No. So this is still very strong. And as I mentioned, it will be interesting to see how the November results come out. And I'd expect to see, once again, a big surge in retail sales. Because November clearly now is the big month for retail spending. Uh, price of oil. And it's interesting that the price of oil has, uh, particularly over the last six months, has started to fall. And I think that's a big factor in seeing our underlying inflation rate falling and our headline inflation rate falling. So maybe not so much to do with higher interest rates, but maybe a lot more to do with lower petrol prices as a result of international oil factors. And it's not just because you and I put petrol in our cars, but it's also because of the spin-on effects with that, uh, with transportation, and also oils used in the production of a lot of other things as well. Yeah, a lot of downstream impacts from higher oil and petrol prices, Michael. As you said, transport and logistics. And uh, uh, if you're paying higher for costs for your transport, you've got to find a way of recovering that. So it does move through, the, I guess, the, the stream of prices. And uh, that's why it has such a significant effect. But as we can see there, that uh, the impact 
over the last six months of lower oil prices has uh, been a significant contributor to lower inflation. So we just need to keep hope to keep that uh, continues to fall, that, those oil prices. And they're still well ahead of where they were pre-COVID, Michael, when yes. we were looking at around about $40 a barrel. Some good news also on house building costs, which did surge as a result of the previous government's home builder policy, as high as 23.3% per year. We were seeing house building costs rise at their peak the middle of last year. But good news there, Michael. At least the trend is now easing. And the latest data shows just an 8% increase in house building costs over the year to October. Still too high, of course, and well ahead of the pre-COVID levels or the pre-stimulus package levels, but heading in the right direction. So let's hope that that continues its downward trend. And that's important as we really need to resupply our housing markets. And that's a, a tremendous roadblock, high house building costs for builders. And it's a tremendous roadblock, as I said, for new development, which we urgently lead. Record Before we move on to migration, Andrew, I think what that suggests is that all new developments that are coming out of the ground are going to have to reach the market at much higher prices to be financially viable. I think that also implies that there's an inherent increased value in established apartments and houses. Yes. Apartments in particular are going to cost a lot more to pull out of the ground, build, develop, uh, and there's extra costs in higher building standards with the issues that occurred a couple of years ago. And so while property values have increased, I'd say there'd be an inherent 25%, 30% equity in established homes that are going to have to establish properties that are going to have to increase in value until the market picks up enough to make new development viable. It's not going to pick up. Developers are not going to take a risk and, until they've got the assurance of higher prices. That's right, Michael. And uh, like I said, at, at least it's moving in the right direction, but it's still significantly higher. I mean, that's what made house, the house building industry so competitive was the fact that prices were predictable going forward, just a couple of percent. But this is something the industry is going to struggle to absorb. And it comes at the worst possible time when we're, we're struggling on the demand side. And this is just another impediment to supply is these record high house building yeah. costs. Even though they're significantly lower, they're still significantly higher than where they used to be. So let's hope that the trend continues going forward. Record migration we saw this year. Remarkable data coming through as post lockdown. No surprise. Once we opened our borders, we normalised our performance in migration. Of course, a lot of that was temporary migrants, students and uh, tourists. But the net migration numbers are inflated by the fact that we didn't lose any, Michael, particularly temporary students, because they weren't here to complete their qualifications and leave. So it was a net positive. Uh, and that would ease over time. But as uh, the government has taken steps to reduce the number of students or tighten up the number of students coming into Australia. I think, however, regardless of that being a, a recognition of the early position, the early year circumstances recovering from border shutdowns and therefore having a high level of net temporary migrants, it's a, a sort of a knee-jerk reaction to issues over high migration. and well, uh, Andrew, we need the students because our education system depends on it and it makes it cheaper for the Australians. But it wasn't that long ago that the, every coffee shop had a sign-up. Barista wanted, staff wanted, wait staff wanted. The migrants, yeah, the, sorry, the students, while they are here to study, also do help our economy churn on. I don't think there's any real evidence, Michael, that the surge in students has... Uh, really created any extra imbalance to our rental markets either, particularly inner city apartment markets, which are favoured by international students when they come in. I'm not saying it had no effect, but I think this is a political decision. Uh, governments around the world are very concerned about their problems with accommodation, providing accommodation for their populace, and Australia's no different. And we're seeing some real political ructions, particularly in Western Europe, in regard to concerns from the voting public over the level of dwellings, you know, over the housing market imbalances. And uh, we have the same problems here. And this is, as I said, we're moving into the political cycle now. And this latest policy from the government is, is a reaction to that. But even though we've had a very big year for migration, it is a catch-up year, Michael. Yep. And there are circumstances such as the fact that we didn't have an outflow of students, just an inflow as a result of COVID lockdowns. And we'll get that outflow 
as these students have come in over the next couple of years will start to uh, leave as they've gained their qualifications. Home building still low. The trend is, uh, hasn't improved this year, just trundling along at very low levels, Michael. Uh, home lending, no surprise. That increased as we saw the housing market pick up, home lending up. And that's the background in terms of what our economy did this year, Michael. But uh, let's have a look at how our housing markets performed in 2023. And here's the uh, all the news, the latest news in terms of house prices. No surprise that Sydney's median house price remains the highest. This is the December quarter data we're going to produce here for our price models. Sydney median house price over 1.5 million. Melbourne over a million, Adelaide and Brisbane reasonably close. Brisbane picked up ahead of Adelaide over the second half of the year and Perth, the underperformer there at just or just under $800,000, its median house price. Uh, prices growth, look at these results, Michael. These are the annual results, December quarter versus December quarter last year. There's a lot of data produced here, in-house data, courtesy of my housing market. We have tens of thousands of data points here, so it's a very strong data set in terms of its robust, I guess, time series nature. But look at Perth. Perth house prices have increased by 15.6% this year, Michael. Brisbane up 12.3%, Adelaide 11.1%, Sydney up 10.4%. So all but Melbourne recorded double figure prices growth this year, Michael, which, you know, in light of some of the silly predictions that were made, Notably by the big banks that where house prices would go, this is a real slap in the face to that credibility of those that did. These, these are very strong results, Michael. And even when we look over the two-year period, because we did have a flattening year last year, we're still in the black in all capitals with the exception of Melbourne. But Melbourne, an underperformer there. I still think that there's some issues in Melbourne reflecting their severity of their lockdown. The Victorian economy is a clear underperformer in terms of all the states. So I think that that really reflects the fact that there's some potential in that Melbourne market going forward, clearly. And I think it just needs a little bit of confidence picked up into that Melbourne market. And I think we might see that early days this year because there's still value opportunities in that Melbourne market with prices, as we'll see, still below where they were at their previous peak. So this is the cycle data. Brisbane is now tracking at record levels up by 2.2% compared to its previous peak. Perth up 1.9%, Adelaide up 0.8 of a percent. Sydney just about back to its previous peak, was, which is in the March quarter last year. But Melbourne's still 3.1% lower than its previous peak, which, similar to Sydney, was in the March quarter last year. So, as I said, still value opportunities in that Melbourne market, Michael. And I think that that'll help to drive demand, all things being equal, next year. Unit prices, Sydney also the highest uh, median unit price over the December quarter. So unit prices in Sydney well ahead of the rest. $749,000 for your median unit price, five seventy five in Melbourne. Similar results there, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, but well below both Melbourne and Sydney. Over the year, not quite a strong performance in unit prices in Sydney and Melbourne. But remember, Michael, last year that unit prices in Sydney and Melbourne outperformed house prices. So... It's a little bit of equalisation, we could say, this year in Melbourne and Sydney. But look how strong those unit markets have been in the smaller capitals. Uh, Adelaide up 17.3%, Perth up 12.5%, and Brisbane up 11.5% over the year. Of course, Adelaide and Perth are smaller unit markets, so they tend to be a bit more volatile. But I think that's a very strong result in the Brisbane unit market, Michael, which is a very big unit market. Of course, a lot of development over the past decade in inner Brisbane for units and to have an increase 11.5%. Was it that long ago that the experts were telling us that the Brisbane market was going to be oversupplied with units for decades? <laughs> so unit price growth versus the previous peak, uh, similar to houses, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane are now tracking at record prices and uh, Sydney down similarly 0.5% from its previous peak of unit prices and Melbourne similar to houses down by 3.8%. So still some value there. Again, in that Melbourne market for unit prices. Let's have a look at the rental market. This is the latest data which covers the month of November. Median prices for houses or rents for houses, $773. Sydney well ahead, similar to houses and units in terms of prices. Rents are significantly higher than the other capitals. Rental growth over the year, big numbers for rents in terms of their increases, house rents 
up by 16.2% in Sydney, 14.1% in Perth, 14% in Melbourne. So very big results there. Brisbane just eased a little bit over November compared to October, but still a very strong result there for Brisbane, up 7.1% for house rents. These are remarkable figures, almost unprecedented figures. A vacancy rate still really crazy low. Vacancy rates uh, for houses over November, all under 1%. And of course, we look at 2% as being the balance mark for vacancy rates. So this is just showing that uh, there's really a lack of choice for tenants in terms of property house rental listings. Unit rents, uh, similar to house rents, Sydney unit rents at uh, $730 a week well ahead of the rest. Adelaide, the most affordable there at $455. Rental growth, this is just really crazy stuff. Still, Michael, where we can see Brisbane unit rents up by 23.8% over the past year. Melbourne and Sydney and Perth all up over 20% as well with Adelaide an underperformer, but still up by 13.4%. These are extraordinary numbers, Michael, of rental yes. growth, annual rental growth, this apartment market, and are still tracking higher, despite the fact that a lot of this was catch up, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, from the lack of demand through the COVID lockdown period. Good returns there for landlords, for both houses and units, despite having to pay higher interest rates over the past year. Well, if you look back like over the last decade, Andrew, rentals hadn't actually increased in line with inflation. So this is in some ways a reversion to the, the mean catching up. But it's not ugly, greedy landlords taking advantage of tenants. It's really the supply and demand situation. But if we go back a couple of slides and say that population is growing strongly and we're not building enough accommodation, there's no end in sight for the rental shortage and the skyrocketing rents, particularly as we know that in general, a few investors are leaving the market, not as many are re-entering the market. So mum and dad investors are the ones who provide the housing stock from over 90% of the rentals, but the government's treating them as ATM machines. They're taking what money they can from them. They're uh, changing the balance uh, of the equation to, towards the tenant with lots of new legislation. So no end in sight for our rental shortage, as far as I can see, Andrew. And I think the only easing, Michael, will be through social change. People's choices for rental accommodation will change. They'll stay at home longer. They'll start combining family groups. Yep. They'll start no longer having one bedroom per child. These sort of choices will be made. And that's the only way that we'll see vacancy rates start to ease because demand will be still there, but it will start to shift into other areas. And uh, beware governments that ignore landlords. And I think governments are now starting to wake up, and we've seen this conversation growing, that perhaps one of the factors that will ease our rental markets is to have more private sector investors and to start offering incentives there. And I think that's the future. And I think if governments want to remain in government... They'll start having to, rather than use the usual ideological claptrap solutions, which have failed miserably, not just in Australia, but overseas, to ease a rental prices. If they don't start looking at the, the essence of our rental market, which is private sector, small scale investors, and try to stimulate that demand to produce more supply, they won't be governments for very long, I think, because they will not be able to fix the rental under supply with any of these sort of Mickey Mouse solutions, which are trying to promote more build to rent propositions, which at the end of the day will only make a marginal impact, if any, on these terrible rental figures. And uh, those unit vacancy rates, Michael, a little bit better for units versus houses, but still nonetheless well below that 2% benchmark that we use as a balanced result for rental markets. And uh, only really Melbourne looking a better proposition for tenants. And really, that Melbourne was supposed to be a, a high rents there, a higher vacancy rates as a product of international students. But we can't see any evidence there of a collapse in Melbourne's vacancy rates. It's still the highest of all the capitals. So just a quick look at yields, gross yields there. Perth has the highest yield, gross yield for houses. These are rental returns on the median house price over November. For units, uh, higher as usual. Yields for units, Perth, they're the highest uh, strong yield there, over 7%, and for Brisbane. And when we look at gross returns, this looks at capital growth plus yields over the year. Strong result there for Perth, 17.7%, Adelaide, 18%, uh, Melbourne, and the underperformer, 6.19% for houses. These are gross returns. 
and for units, again, a little higher for units than for houses, notwithstanding that the Melbourne and Sydney unit capital growth was lower than houses, but of course its yields were higher because its rental growth was higher. So we also have our auction market year in review wrap, Michael. We can see how auction clearance rates are a good forward indicator of house prices there. When we track the both of them in Sydney, you can see those trends also in Melbourne that higher clearance rates, higher house prices, lower clearance rates, lower house prices. Sydney auction market just eased over the year, but very strong results in autumn and still very positive results given a surge in listing numbers at the end of the year. Similar position in Melbourne, still held above 60% despite high numbers of listings uh, and very big results there in May and into June. Brisbane also fell away a little bit towards the end of the year, but those results in Brisbane tend to be more volatile than the major auction markets of Sydney and Melbourne. Adelaide just tracked below its uh, most of the year 80% results on a monthly basis, Michael, weekend clearance rates. But uh, Adelaide just slipped down in December below 80%. So this very strong boom market in Adelaide, particularly the auction boom, just eased through December. And Canberra was an underperformer for most of the year, but just started to show some signs of life. I think Canberra is a bit of a, an opportunity next year. I think that Canberra market, for whatever reason, fell away in the second half of this year, 2023. But I think that sets it up for a, uh, a better year next year. In a moment, Dr. Andrew Wilson is going to present his forecasts for the next year. But I just want to interrupt this presentation for a moment to explain to you that this is general information because we don't know your specific circumstances, so we don't know what you could or what you should do. But I guess I'd like to ask you a quick question. Are you satisfied with how your property portfolio has been performing in 2023 or how your property plans went? Did it bring you closer to the financial freedom goals you're looking for? Or are you a bit stuck with the banks making life a bit more difficult or the uncertainties that are in the market? Look, no matter where 2023 took you, if you're a home buyer or a property investor, my question to you is, what are you going to do differently with this information? What are you going to do differently in 2024? Because our housing markets are going to be very, very different to 2023. If you'd like to prepare yourself to grow your wealth through residential real estate and uncover the next steps, I invite you to have a complimentary wealth discovery chat with one of the wealth strategists at Metropole. Now you can go to workwithmetropole.com.au, but I'm going to suggest you just pull out your phone for a sec and scan this QR code and leave us your details and we'll be in contact with you. The multi-award winning team at Metropole are much more than buyers agents. We'll help our clients selfly grow into generational wealth through property. We're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, but we're small enough to care. So scan the QR code, get out your phone, leave us your details, and we'd love to help you formulate a strategic property plan. We want to help you plan to become the person, the people you plan to become. So we did have those predictions of 10% house price falls this year, 20%, 30%, take your number. I think when we looked at the historical evidence, we could see there's only four years where house prices in Australia, capital city, house prices, uh, weighted average house prices fell. In 2022, we were down by 4.3%. And our results to date over December up 8.6%, Michael. So national house prices up 8.6% this year, December to December uh, and the average, which is above the average 36-year growth of 6.8%. It's interesting, it's only really been in latter decades where we've seen house prices fall, and maybe there's a little bit of responsibility there for those scare campaigns that uh, were pretty active in those years, and I think that influenced uh, buyers to sit on their hands and sellers to sit on their hands, which created that, uh, I guess, a downturn environment but of course, that was followed by very strong bounce backs as all that pent up demand was released. So only four years and the worst result was in 2018, where prices fell by 5.5%, Michael. But as I'm sure you remember, we had the mother of all scare campaigns in 2018 in regard to what was going to happen in the housing market. And who'll ever forget those predictions across the board from the media of 40% house prices falls in 2019, which of course proved to be a complete claptrap. So that's the, the historical evidence in terms of our housing market activity. These are my predictions for next year's housing market, Michael. 
Uh, I think that Perth, Brisbane and Adelaide will lead the charge. They have been the strongest performers this year, of course. Uh, and I think that will continue up by mid-range mid around 6%. Sydney and Canberra up by 5%. I think Canberra is due for a revival given a weaker second half to the year. I have confidence in Melbourne. I think Melbourne will be in the black by 4% next year. I think there's plenty of value in that Melbourne market. Darwin and Hobart, maybe a little bit optimistic there with 3%, but Hobart tends to go against the trend in a way. It was a weaker market when markets were stronger the second half of 2023, but did start to bounce back. So perhaps Hobart will record a little bit higher than that 3%. For units, those smaller markets, well, Adelaide and Perth, which were strong this year, 2023, I think will also continue to grow 6%. Brisbane of a larger market up by 6%. Also good returns there for Brisbane. Landlords, uh, Sydney 5%, Melbourne Hobart up 3%, Canberra 2% and Darwin up 1%. So they're my predictions for next year, Michael. We can revisit those in a year's time and see how we went. But I'm uh, reasonably confident uh, given no rotten outside force and I can't see anything happening. In fact, I think the circumstances for inflation are looking a little bit better at this point of time. And these things can change, particularly with the price of oil, as we've discussed. And that might mean that we won't have the interest rate increases in 2024 that we had in 2023, which is always good news for affordability. And I think our economy really is going nowhere. I think even if we do get an easing in unemployment by having higher unemployment rates, I think they'll only be marginal going forward. This is a very strong economy. So it could be a good year, still strong economy, certainly a positive economy not the impost of higher interest rates because of uh, lower inflation. And I think house prices will um, report some positive results there. And uh, I think a number of those markets might perform better than those uh, predictions. But we'll wait and see, Michael, what happens in terms of the big picture. And of course, as we always say, and we've alluded to to some degree, that information and ignorance remain the curse of our housing markets, except for those that rationalise and act on the fear that it generates and in 2024, I certainly believe, once again, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. But we could basically say that every year or every cycle in our housing markets. And there are our capital city housing markets. And once again, set to remain global leaders next year. And just Google up all the results of the major economies. Have a look at how their housing markets performed in 2023. Then have a look at how Australia performed. And then you can see why I say that we will remain global leaders next year in terms of our housing market activity. So that's my year in review, Michael. I hope there's some value there for those that watched it. And uh, I look forward to what will be, again, a positive 2024 for the housing market. And I think at least we're entering 2024 with a bit more of an optimistic mindset generally. But who knows, that clickbait is almost irresistible when we see those headlines coming at us to uh, describe doom and gloom in our what are generally bulletproof housing markets? So thank you for that, Andrew. That was very useful because there are patterns that we see. And having been around the block a few times, both you and I can see patterns where a lot of other people just see chaos. So I like the fact that you're bringing it down to simplicity. I know a lot of people think there are a million factors involved in our housing markets, but in fact, there's only a few fundamentals that drive them in the direction they're going to head. I think 2024 is going to be a year where consumer confidence will start to increase as yeah. we eventually realise interest rates have peaked, whether there's going to be another rise or, rise or not. Eventually they will peak, they will eventually fall, our economy is going to stabilise and there's unfortunately still going to be geopolitical problems yeah. overseas, local political issues as well. But that's the way it is every year. So one just has to look back. And I think that chart that showed the resilience of the housing markets year after year, rising, and even when there's the occasional fall, because each boom leads, uh, yeah. the, it sets up for the next downturn, just as each downturn sets up for the next boom. But just look at the long-term trends, because that's the way you need to be in property. Well, I really appreciate this effort you put in putting that together, Andrew. And we'll be back once each week uh, with our regular Property Insider videos. When the auction market resumes, you'll be back with your weekly auction reports and the, your Andrew Wilson LinkedIn profile. Have a fantastic festive season and a great 2024, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And thanks to everybody who's watched us and for all the feedback that we've had. We always uh, appreciate the comments, regardless of their nature, because it's all about sustaining what we hope is very positive intelligence for decision-making for home buyers and sellers out there.
Thanks, Andrew. Well, I hope you got benefit from the presentation with Dr. Andrew Wilson and myself, and I hope you can also see that 2024 is going to create opportunities for some people. And I think at the end of this year, this new year of 2024, some people are going to have taken advantage of the market. But my prediction is that a lot of people are going to sit on the sidelines because that's what happens every year. They're going to wait for the timing to be right. The timing is never exactly right. So what I'm going to suggest you do is have a complimentary wealth discovery chat with one of the wealth strategists at Metropole. Just pull out your phone and scan this QR code. Just take a photo of it or go to workwithmetropole.com.au and have a chat to uncover the next steps to see what's possible, what's likely. An initial chat is obligation free and our services don't suit everybody, but we'd love to have a chat with you and explain. Remember the multi-award winning team at Metropole are much more than just buyers agents. We'll help our clients safely grow into generational wealth through property. We're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, but still small enough to care. So whether you're just getting started or want to grow your existing portfolio, let our team help you. We offer a time-tested system, frameworks I've fine-tuned over five decades. We've got a proven track record, on the ground experience rather than like a lot of other people who fly in and fly out. We've got offices and our own teams in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane and we don't sell property but we also have high net worth clients seeking our advice through Metropole Wealth Advisory and our elite advisory services. Work with Metropole to help you grow the wealth you deserve.